Um, thank you, Shriyan, for that uh, introduction earlier. And thank you uh, very much, everybody, uh, for tuning in uh, for my talk. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a study that I conducted in the year 2018 uh, about the lipids uh, of wake-up food. And uh, I'll be sharing some of my results and observations uh, based on that and uh, about the importance of the landscape and uh, why we should protect the cat and also uh, the digital general introduction about the uh, leopard as well. <clears throat> so just click this? Yes. So before I uh, begin my lecture, I would like to uh, dedicate this to, uh, to everybody who has uh, uh, contributed uh, the time and effort uh, uh, towards uh, the conservation of uh, the leopard in Sri Lanka. And uh, those of who have uh, contributed through their scientific work and conservation efforts uh, to protect the animal. And also everybody who has uh, uh, put all the effort to, uh, uh, to make Sri Lanka uh, an important uh, destination uh, for leopard weaving globally. And I'm deadly uh, thankful to everybody uh, for all this uh, effort they put into. <clears throat> so uh, the leopard is, is one of the most adaptable big cats in the world. And uh, this picture really says it all. How uh, So this is a picture of a uh, uh, leopard from Sanjay Gandhi National Park, right in the middle of uh, uh, the Mumbai city which is um, uh, extremely busy around and it's just an isolated fragment of forest right in the middle of the city. And these cats are surviving uh, somehow uh, with whatever prey, prey that's available. And uh, they are right now uh, in uh, coexistence with humans. There's a population of about 35 to 40 individuals in this 100 square, square kilometer uh, area of forest patch. And uh, uh, as you can see in this map, uh, the leopard is uh, found uh, from Africa right across, right across Asia and uh, right up to Java. And uh, the Java leopard and the Sri Lankan leopard are the only existing uh, surviving uh, island leopards in, uh, in the world. And uh, one of the reasons why the, the Leopard is so adaptable. Uh, is it has over evolution? Uh, over evolution, it has achieved this perfect medium, medium, medium-sized body, uh, where it requires less protein uh, compared to its competitors, such as other large big cats, such as lions and tigers. So they can uh, they can survive in whatever whatever prey that's available in the landscape. Uh, so as you can see, this graphic over here. <clears throat> Uh, leopards able to feed on animals as small as dung beetles to giant eland, land, which weighs about 1,000 kilograms. And also there are populations in Cambodia where they're known to bring down animals as big as uh, bantang uh, that are 950 kilograms, 900 kilograms uh, uh, in total weight. <clears throat> and also um, in Sri Lanka, they're known to feed on lizards, uh, small garden lizards, small lizards, hare, and animals as big as samba deer and young buffalo. And um, the Sri Lankan leopard is an endemic subspecies, uh, a phylogenetically much younger subspecies. We believe that it arrived Sri Lanka somewhere around the late Pleistocene, uh, early Holocene period, and uh, and was in isolation uh, for more, more than 10,000 years without any intragill, that is, without any uh, direct competitors uh, such as other apex predators. However, <clears throat> it did exist uh, uh, with, uh, coexist with tigers and uh, Indian wild dogs, as you can see here, that are able to bring down animals as big as samba deer. And, uh, but there have, there are the disadvantages, such as they have to form big packs to feed their packs and tigers will have large, will need large areas to feed on larger prey, uh, but the leopard and it's, uh, adaptable uh, behavior has uh, outcompeted uh, these large carnivores and are now in uh, uh, 
competition with uh, the other most uh, adaptable uh, species in the world, that's us humans. And uh, uh, the Sri Lankan leopardies is widely spread uh, throughout the country, uh, from uh, found in the beaches of Yala, right up to the mountains of Adams Peak and Pidurutalagala, and uh, also found in the uh, in human influenced uh, areas like uh, the TA states and the forest edges, and also in busy cities like uh, the outskirts of Kandy. And they're thriving, they thrive in uh, habitats such as. Uh, uh, these scrub forests and also um, <clears throat> uh, monsoon forests of the dry and semi-arid zone uh, of the country. <clears throat> this is the current distribution of uh, leopards in the island. Uh, we believe that uh, the total number of uh, uh, the total uh, population in Sri Lanka is around is, be is below thousand individuals. And uh, however, yeah. The past uh, 30 years has been a uh, large hindrance of uh, research, and that is simply uh, due to uh, the war that took place uh, in Sri Lanka. And uh, if you look at the current landscape uh, and uh, match it up with the uh, leopard's distribution, uh, what you see on the right side is where the war prone area was. Uh, and uh, on your left side, you can see the current uh, uh, protect area, area network uh, in Sri Lanka, and that aligns uh, perfectly with the war prone area. And uh, this was one of the reasons why um, we also selected uh, Ripatu National Park uh, to uh, study. Uh, um, and also, uh, the Ripa and Ripatu National Park also was uh, under the influence of the war and was closed up down for about 16 years. <clears throat> Due to several incidents uh, uh, within uh, that happened within the national park, and um, but the army uh, came in and carried out a thorough demining project, and by February 2010, uh, uh, they opened the national park for the public, and uh, the national park is in fact the largest uh, national park in Sri Lanka. Uh, and uh, together with Yal National Park, and it's also one of the oldest national parks uh, in in the island, and if not one of the oldest uh, in Asia as well. Um, it is about 1.8 times the size of Singapore, and it has a variety of uh, different habitats. And uh, a common name that's uh, that we call Vipatu is the land of lakes, and this is because uh, the availability of uh, is unique habitat uh, called wildus, uh, which are uh, large disc-like doorline depressions uh, that seep in water off the line cast plains uh, distributed from the central uh, pass of Vilpatu right across towards the east, eastern uh, and northeastern sections of, uh, of the park and the terrain. And the park also harbors uh, a high diversity of species uh, that is supported by uh, uh, various different habitat types uh, in the in the national park. Uh, these are some of the species that um, it's found uh, in the national park, from elephants to bears and chameleons, and also lorises and pangolins. <clears throat> so one of the main uh, objectives of our study, uh, well, to study leopards, is to provide uh, reliable uh, data on the population and its dynamics uh, within the national park. <clears throat> And surrounding areas uh, that would support uh, and uh, support conservation managers and help de develop uh, effective management plans uh, for uh, the future to conserve uh, the leopard and its uh, habitat. So a primary tool that we used uh, in this case was uh, were camera traps. And I'm not sure if uh, if this plot can be visible. Okay, is, this, is, it, is it all right, yeah? So this unit um, takes pictures uh, as something moves in front of it. So what you're seeing here is the sensor, and uh, this is the lens uh, that captures the image. So what the sensor is a thermal motion sensor uh, that triggers for any movement, uh, uh, and also a temperature difference uh, 
uh, when an animal moves by compared to the uh, ambient temperature. And so we placed these camera traps on the side of the road <clears throat> and uh, we set them right across uh, heterogeneity of uh, habitats uh, and uh, set up camera traps in areas where there were uh, sufficient uh, information on uh, the presence of leopards, such as tracks, scats, scat, and also scratch marks on trees uh, to have, uh, to, uh, to have uh, good captures. And uh, I was very particular about uh, obtaining extremely sharp images of, uh, of, of leopards because this has been a big hindrance uh, in other studies. So I would spend a lot of time uh, setting up my camera traps uh, properly, uh, spending about sometimes an hour, two hours uh, just to get the images right. And uh, thankfully I had an extremely good efficient team uh, from Kulu Safaris and the Department of Wildlife guys were very helpful. <clears throat> and uh, with that, we also placed a camera trap in the southern southern part of uh, Wilpath National Park, um, uh, close to uh, the mangrove areas of uh, Kumburavia. We had to, to get there, we had to go by boat over the Putram Lagoon and enter the national park uh, through the river to place this camel trap and this yielded uh, extremely good uh, pictures and uh, of various wildlife from leopards, bears, elephants and uh, fishing cats and also a jungle cat. Uh, but despite all this effort, we did have trouble with uh, bears and uh, elephants. So the video I'm gonna show now is, uh, is how an elephant came and disrupted one of our camel trap stations and uh, well, it eventually came and uh, fed on the, uh, the post, the bark of the post that we uh, laid down. So let me just click it. Yeah. <clears throat> Regardless of all that, we managed to get some really good pictures of uh, of leopards. Uh, this was a big male that was found in the southeastern parts of uh, Wilpato, frequenting a large area, and would also would observe, we would observe it traveling about sometimes 20 kilometers uh, in one day, uh, triggering a series of camel traps. And this young male uh, that was found in southern parts of uh, Wilpato close to the Markland Madua area and this beautiful uh, female from the Ikirigo Lava tank and uh, um, and this was a this is a video of a very inquisitive young male that came and uh, inspected uh, one of our camera traps they are quite aware about the changes that happen in the environment and uh, would uh, always come and take a look especially the young ones Yes. And we also managed to capture some great images of uh, various other sea species, such as fishing cats, as you can see on the picture on the bottom left, and the jungle cat, and bats cleaning, uh, for possibly for mosquitoes and other external parasites, uh, insect parasites, and uh, this is another inquisitive bear that came and destroyed our truck station in this, this case. <clears throat> I will talk a little bit about uh, leopard identification uh, because this is something that's very important uh, when it comes to estimating density of, of uh, any animal that you want to uh, study. And uh, it's not hard, it's just very easy as lions, unlike lions or mountain lions that have uniform coat colors, 
uh, where you have to rely on uh, whisker spot ratios and just you have to have a good shot of the face. Whereas leopards, jaguars, and cheetahs have spots and rosettes all over the body. So all you have to do is just uh, manage to get a good picture and uh, compare with uh, uh, another and just select a good portion of it and try to match it up. <clears throat> and what you do here is uh, just look for patterns. Uh, pattern recognition is the most important thing here. And uh, so just you can see like a human form uh, in, amidst these uh, uh, spots and rosettes. So you take a good chunk and uh, just compare it and look the relative position of each of these rosettes and uh, spots. And I sometimes even name uh, leopards after whatever spot pattern I, I notice. Uh, and I mean, in this case, I see, see it as a, a, like a ghostly pattern, so I call it a phantasma. But I do have uh, uh, other the names that I uh, put in uh, with uh, the strong code uh, to uh, relate to the animal. And uh, in this case, uh, this is a male leopard, and you can see uh, you just see the same thing. You take a chunk and then compare it with. And in this case, I see a stripe here, and just look at the relative position position from here. I call this leopard linearis. Uh, because of the stripe, and then you compare it with uh, the other flank uh, that's available. But in this case, you can see that some of the rosettes and spots are a bit distorted. And this is because uh, it has possibly gone through some uh, 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 competition or uh, fight with another male or some other animal, and which is why you need to have uh, good, uh, then, uh, good, good pictures of uh, of a good area of uh, of a leopard's flank or either both flanks. So in case in this case you can tell the difference and uh, identify the leopard as it's the same. And in case you can't, then you can look at the arm or the belly or the neck area uh, to get a good understanding and uh, match the species and uh, match match the animal. Uh, sexing leopards is also important, and you need to get this right. Uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, you look at secondary sexual characteristics of uh, males and females, uh, availability and the presence of testes in males. And um, if you can see here, males will have uh, males will have a uh, well-developed gular sac uh, between the chin and the skin fold, between the skin and the neck, and uh, Males will also have a prominent belly fold, as you can see in this particular big male. And with females, uh, pregnant females and uh, females who have just given birth will have their teeth uh, quite uh, prominently showing. So based on these characters, you can uh, tell the sex. And uh, also, if you want, you can also age uh, leopards based on these. Um, so with all that effort, we managed to get a total of uh, 133 individuals uh, during this period uh, we uh, carried out our project and a total of 552 um, captures of uh, uh, images of different of leopards uh, during the period and of that 17 individuals uh, were under the year under the age of two years and these are individuals individuals we discard from our analysis uh, simply because there's a high mortality rate uh, for individual uh, juveniles. Uh, it could be infanticide, it could be uh, deaths caused by bears and, and uh, wild boar, even jackal. And uh, this was a uh, sex distribution. So, but our uh, uh, best fitting model uh, gave us a sex ratio of uh, 1.5 females to males. And uh, we did uh, get a good number of adults and also uh, sub-adults as well. And uh, so total positively sexed individuals, individuals were 108 uh, in our database. And uh, the density from our best fitting model was uh, 16 individuals per 100 square kilometers. And this in comparison with uh, the global stats available uh, is, is in the medium to high range uh, just like the rest of uh, Sri Lanka's um, other other national parks, the studies done in other national parks, and uh, and uh, the key thing about Sri Lanka is that it lacks, like I said earlier, it lacks any uh, uh, higher higher order predator uh, 
competition and also very minimal anthropogenic uh, mortality rates, uh, which is why it stands out. So the two green, uh, the numbers uh, that I've highlighted here are also uh, national parks with very minimal uh, anthropogenic uh, mortality rates uh, or non-existent at all, for example, like Sami Sands. But uh, it does have uh, 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 competition with uh, larger predators such as in Java with doors and Sabi Sands with hyenas and lions. <clears throat> so apart from the good side uh, of all this, uh, so we also managed to get uh, uh, really good captures of uh, uh, prey species uh, and these all supports uh, together with a variety of different habitats. Supports a very healthy uh, population of leopards and this really highlights the importance of the landscape. Uh, and uh, well, apart from all these uh, good sides, uh, we did observe some uh, negative aspects uh, within the national park and outside uh, it's uh, outside the national park as well. Uh, not many people are aware about the atrocities that are taken, taking place inside the national park due to uh, various media sensationalized stories about uh, stories that are happening on the uh, border or outside of the national park. So i uh, run through one by one. And one of the key problems we identified here is poaching. It's not direct poaching for leopards, but poaching for samba deer and spotted deer, uh, mainly their targets. And these poachers enter the national park from the southern border, the eastern border, or through the fence. And also they come by boat and ex enter the national park via boat, uh, uh, from the west coast and uh, this is a massive problem that we identified uh, during the study and uh, there were poachers in the park where we were present doing our studies and uh, so this is a typical hide <clears throat> and where people would dug a hole and stay there for the whole night and uh, stalk samba deer, spotted deer or even uh, uh, wild boar that comes to, comes to drink uh, water from these uh, drying up waterfalls. And uh, these are some of the uh, signs that we came across. Uh, they would stay in the park after they make a kill. They dry it up for three, four days, and then head out uh, back to their villages. Now they walk in just like it's just their, as if it's their backyard. And uh, this is what we uh, found out. And another big problem here in, uh, in uh, what we identified here was uh, what I got to know is now it's somewhat under control is the expansion and the increase of uh, festive activities of uh, the Pallakandal church. So there's a very old church that's uh, in the national park we really close to Pomparipu uh, from the eastern entrance, uh, just north of Veluan Kuluma. And uh, just after the war, uh, they decided they had plans to expand the church, uh, church footprint, and uh, basically encroach into the national park by being inside. And, uh, this would bring uh, all sorts of problems uh, to uh, ex external pressure that's un very un unnecessary for uh, uh, protected area like uh, Wipak National Park. And increasing festive activities would result in uh, uh, pollution, noise pollution, and uh, could also result in fatality to killings in, in, in case uh, there's an attack by any wild animal uh, on a person that comes in. And we see this with Padayatra, it has been happening. And I believe it's time that uh, all you know, these activities, the traditional activities, which are somewhat, which are allowed under the FFPO, but it would be good to assess and reassess these uh, activities uh, for the betterment of, uh, of uh, wildlife and uh, nature. <clears throat> Another very important uh, uh, problem that, uh, no one really uh, thinks about is, and also uh, is uh, something that uh, uh, really goes under uh, the carpet, is uh, this road that's been built illegally right across the National Park, connecting Putlam and Mana. Uh, this was also done post-war uh, to uh, facilitate uh, movement across the, through the cities and uh, avoid the Vilachia and the Madhavachia uh, 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 routes to Mena, uh, but what we did find out is that uh, uh, 
animals here, when we set up two camera trucks in these two stations, the animals are more nocturnal and they avoid the busy uh, uh, busy road. Uh, and uh, there are buses, lorries, tractors that, that use this road. And, uh, and also there was a problem with my camera traps also. It just drained out a lot of my battery uh, in that sense. Uh, and so there's so many vehicles moving through this road. And uh, there were several road kids that we observed over time as well. And uh, it's something that needs to be addressed. But on a good note, what I got to know is that the causeway that connects uh, Elwan Kulama and the main road is uh, is broken down. And since January, everybody has to resort to the uh, the other roads, the alternative roads to head to Mera. And uh, this is something uh, even the department is also fighting for and to uh, clear off. What would you like to send? You can ask me to send an email or send a text message. And uh, the fishing village, uh, there are two traditional fishing, fish, fishing villages in the National Park uh, that we came across uh, that I found here. And these are traditional fishing villages which are uh, allowed uh, under the uh, FFPO. But what's going on is as expansion and uh, within these villages and uh, and could lead to unnecessary uh, problems like human, uh, it might develop uh, into conflict situations uh, between uh, humans and uh, uh, and leopards and other wild animals. In in the Pukkulma village, uh, just last year, there was a, uh, there was a uh, death of a leopard uh, uh, last year, and we believe that was probably in retaliation to uh, to um, uh, the uh, either cattle or uh, a pet. And uh, and last year in Palubatri, um, so last year again in Palubatri there was an attack uh, by a leopard uh, in the in the village itself. And uh, in Palubatri, what we observed is that uh, <coughs> uh, people would walk, would get off from the bus on this main road and walk through the road available right through the bushes and enter and get to their villages. And this is this was an ac accident waiting to happen. And uh, and, uh, and one of the things what we observed here was that uh, we came across this uh, uh, cub and mum uh, and usually uh, leopard leopardesses with uh, cubs are quite protective of their cubs uh, to any um, uh, any uh, intruder uh, around them. And uh, this was an accident where it happened. So we did warn the uh, wildlife, which eventually sent, when the, the message was sent out uh, to the villagers. But uh, just last year, there was an attack in the village uh, and this boy was injured severely uh, and he was rushed to hospital via boat. And so these so these sort of human influences should uh, be controlled or stopped at some point and uh, let them carry out the seasonal fishing uh, but also uh, not let them expand uh, their footprint in a protected area like we <clears throat> and uh, apart from all this uh, the post war development that happened in the surrounding uh, network as you can see here uh, so all these uh, Areas were declared as uh, uh, forest reserves under the forest department uh, in 2012. But in 2013, 14, uh, these areas were encroached uh, to resettle supposed uh, internally dispersed uh, persons um, by the government back then. And for that, they cut down the forest reserves and cleared out land and settled these people here which resulted in a great destruction of forests. This was the case that was very prominently known as the Vilpattu uh, uh, case uh, in the media. And uh, so in 2017, uh, they disestablished all these uh, forest reserves and uh, did a, uh, did a uh, re regasseted the remaining chunks of uh, forests and uh, was declared as uh, Marvelu Conservation for Forest, uh, 
which is in par in terms of protection with the national park of uh, the under the DWC. Um, the ca the case was closed recently, and I will talk a little bit on that judgment uh, towards the end of this uh, presentation. And of course, the, the mythical, the non-existent, uh, supposed buffer zone of the Vipath National Park. The reason I say that is because most of it is encroached over time. If you, if you come to the entrance of Hunuvila Gama, pretty much all those areas, all those uh, shops and uh, houses and villages are all uh, part of the buffer zone. And uh, there are strict laws to uh, control activity in these areas. And, uh, but yet uh, last this year, we did see uh, Project Resurrect and uh, that was uh, kept, uh, kept away a couple of years back that came out and they cleared out a good chunk of land <clears throat> for a aloe vera uh, plantation. And uh, these kind of, and, and this is completely legal and it is uh, essential under the law that uh, uh, Project proponent uh, will have to uh, do an uh, do a study, an IE or an EIA, uh, to get permission from the Department of Wildlife. And uh, it is essential to protect the buffer zones uh, of of an, a national park. Uh, uh, and I will talk about that uh, in a bit more in detail later. And uh, based on all these, uh, some of the main recommendations uh, I'd like to introduce is. Uh, is to carry out long-term monitoring of, uh, of populations in, uh, in 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 national parks and especially in, the, in, in a large national park like Vipassana National Park. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Population-based conservation actions are essential, and uh, long-term monitoring. We can repeat the same study we did, and uh, we hope to do it in another couple of years. And in between, we can. Uh, carry on monitoring by engaging stakeholder groups such as uh, uh, enthusiasts, wildlife enthusiasts that enter the national park uh, for, uh, for their own fun and also the tourism industry uh, hotels that are carrying out safari, uh, safaris inside the national park, whoever takes pictures can contribute and we can also we can keep monitoring uh, in these uh, times to uh, understand what the population dynamics and the movements of uh, leopards in these areas, and also it's essential to study uh, <coughs> the prey abundance uh, in uh, this national in in a, in a protected area like this to keep check on uh, the distribution of prey and the abundance. And this can be done uh, biannually or annually, ideally biannually, biannually uh, studying the wet and dry seasons. And uh, I'd like to see uh, the DWC introducing uh, such uh, such a project uh, to study uh, these prey uh, prey abundance uh, in in protect in protected area uh, just as we've seen in india with the forest department doing all this uh, there and uh, <clears throat> to be a sense it will be important to uh, study uh, how the dynamics are around the national park uh, Look for human in leopard interactions that are already taking place, and study closer at communities, uh, looking at the knowledge, attitudes, and practices. Because if you look around the border of Vipatu, you have various different communities living uh, with uh, following different uh, uh, religious uh, practices and cultural practices. So their attitudes will change, and knowledge will change. And uh, in order to uh, uh, avoid, avoid conflict in the future. Uh, it would be essential to uh, study uh, these interactions uh, 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 in these areas. <clears throat> and of course, the most important thing uh, I want to highlight here is, in, is to eliminate poaching in and around uh, the national park. <clears throat> uh, what you're seeing here uh, these yellow points are the areas where we came across um, poaching activities. And uh, the blue lines, the pure blue lines, are areas where there are roads ex in existence but are not used by anyone in the tourism industry. And the red and blue lines are the ones that are sometimes very seldomly used uh, by the tourism industry. And uh, well, the past year and a half, I think uh, these roads are not. Uh, 
uh, have not been used properly because uh, it was not in good condition. But this, the point I'm trying to raise here is that it supports the common notion that uh, so, so the fast safari industry, tourism in national parks somewhat uh, acts as a passive and reporting uh, method uh, to control uh, uh, poaching in these so poachers avoid the busy roads and uh, would uh, carry out the activities uh, in these uh, less busy areas. And uh, in, in addition to poachers, there are treasure hunters and uh, honey collectors that get in uh, to these areas as if it's a backyard and go about their illegal businesses. Uh, <clears throat> so what we also found out was that um, the reason why they do this poaching is not for subsistence. Uh, there is a demand outside in Putlam and also in Colombo where they send out dried up meat. So one request I would like to make in the pub for the public is to um, avoid uh, bushmeat as much as possible. Just avoid, avoid bushmeat. I, I know it's available around in most hotels, around national parks. And I know people go out, uh, when they go out on pilgrimage, pilgrimages or also holidays, that they would uh, look for bushmeat, as, uh, especially if locals, they would go look for bushmeat. And uh, as we saw uh, this, this whole year, since last year, December, we had a total of uh, 12 leopard deaths. And uh, this, was, this was all because of uh, poaching activities that took place right throughout the island. And uh, one way the community can help is by avoiding uh, avoiding uh, uh, bushmeat and just saying no to it straight off. And uh, once the demand is cut off, uh, they will look for uh, other options. The park warden stepped in uh, <clears throat> against the sporting problem and uh, took some really drastic drastic steps to control. And I uh, must really commend him uh, for these activities uh, for that he took place, uh, took over. He introduced, he got the special forces and the commandos down to um, control and manage the borders. And now I know that uh, in the Iluankulam, Puliankulam, the southern parts of uh, uh, Wipatsu, there are no, uh, po the poachers are not entering the national park from the south. Uh, and this is a very good positive uh, note and I hope uh, this is being practiced. This could be practiced elsewhere. And we could also look at training uh, uh, the wildlife department and in, uh, introduce uh, smart patrolling or even other anti poaching techniques <clears throat> uh, to our protected area. And uh, as I spoke about tourism, tourism, yes, it does help in some ways, but uh, it has to be responsible tourism practices. Everybody has to follow ethics uh, and follow the rules laid out in the national park. And uh, and the common notion, and a common no notion even among ac academics, that is that tourism is bad for national parks. But the the, the theory here is that animals are already have been habituated for um, for jeeps and other vehicles inside national parks over time. And they see it as a neutral entity. Uh, it all depends on the behavior of jeeps, but yes, it's a, it's a neutral entity that doesn't harm them and they are unable to bring down. Um, so it is essential jeep drivers understand this and they drive around and be a neutral entity and not scare away leopards or other, other animals uh, with their driving, and uh, also that is negative. Those are negative interactions, and also positive stimuli would be like feeding animals. We've seen in Yala how uh, bad it is with uh, some elephants uh, that come after jeeps, and also I've seen now uh, mongoose and also peacock uh, that come after jeeps uh, for food. So we don't want this sort of positive positive interactions happening inside national parks as well. The whole idea is to be to keep giving a, a neutral a stimuli, and uh, whoever that goes into the park also should make sure that they stay within the boundaries of the vehicle, because that's what uh, animals are used to. The distinction here is that they're not habituated to humans, but they're habituated to vehicles, and uh, so you should not, should not put your body out, head out, arm out, and uh, cause disturbances 
in uh, while you're viewing uh, wild animals. Of course, there'll be times when, uh, when we'll have to do this and uh, the guide or the Jeep driver should be aware to uh, uh, explain and uh, guide based on that. And uh, yeah, these are some of the main things to remember, of course, uh, when uh, going on uh, safaris. And uh, it, this will really help uh, 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 in, a, in a long term manner. And also, something to mention is that the Jeep drivers in, uh, in Vipatu, uh, I've seen them, they're more well behaved compared to other national parks, and I hope they keep it up uh, just like that. And I hope the uh, park authorities pay a lot of attention uh, into this and uh, control all this. <clears throat> And uh, in the end, the most uh, another important aspect is, of course, in a, in a, in a larger scale, uh, yes, uh, Vipatu is a stronghold, and uh, uh, but it's it will be useless if not for its uh, the surrounding intact protected areas. And uh, this is a unique case, uh, similar to how Yala is right now, with uh, surrounded by healthy protected area and it is essential that uh, these areas are these stay areas stay protected and the boundaries are kept uh, safe because fragmentation can lead to uh, severe uh, problems uh, depletions in uh, populations over time and uh, especially with leopards uh, that require large areas to uh, uh, move around and uh, especially males, uh, young males that disperse out of their uh, territorial natal areas to establish new areas. It is essential that uh, these areas stay protected. And these create what we call meta metapopulation dynamics, where a source population like Vipatta would uh, keep feeding uh, low density populations surrounding uh, that are high, uh, that are, have some increased uh, human activity and uh, vice versa. Uh, where animals can disperse into a source population and uh, uh, maintain protection, uh, maintain uh, the integrity of uh, populations. And uh, <clears throat> uh, it's also essential to main maintain, uh, uh, minimize harmful edge effects and maintain the integrity of uh, the buffer zone and reduce uh, conflict between humans and leopards. Yes, like I said earlier, humans are known to uh, inhabit and thrive in uh, some uh, disturbed land, uh, landscapes such as in India, as, as we've seen with uh, Dr. Vidya Atreya's uh, studies, and also in Sri Lanka where they are found in uh, busy uh, surrounding areas of busy cities, cities like Kandy. Uh, but uh, these areas are highly fragmented, and uh, uh, in the future we really should be looking at uh, connecting these uh, 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 forests that are fragmented and uh, make sure there are population dynamics and meta population dynamics in existence, uh, especially for an insular population like Sri Lanka. Um, if you look at uh, where we are <clears throat> in, in comparison to the rest of the subspecies, we are actually in a better position. If you look at the range loss over time, uh, we are. Uh, also in a much better position. And uh, also, if you look at the populations in Sri Lanka, most almost 50% of them are found within protected area. And this is a huge advantage uh, uh, for the Sri Lankan leopard. And uh, if you compare this with the other insular population, the Javan leopard, <coughs> uh, that is uh, that has a very small fragmented population uh, found in protected area. And so we are actually in a better place. And I, think, I believe this is the right time <clears throat> to act and move forward. And uh, the key things is, like I said earlier, is to make sure our protected areas stay protected. And it's not just for the leopard. And uh, it's for also the other species that supports the leopard, uh, which is a keystone species. And uh, also because eventually, um, if the population start to decline, and uh, there are uh, the fragmentation of a protected area network keeps going on, and uh, 
we can't we, we don't have the we can't any we can't seek for any transboundary uh, connections as we have seen with some recoveries of the tigers and uh, leopards in um, other landscapes as we are an island <clears throat> as, as we are an island so it is essential that uh, we think right now and uh, uh, authorities politicians the general public uh, public uh, have a general sense about um, uh, the situation we are in right now yes the leopard is a highly protected species uh, by the law and it is also a keystone species that controls and is an essential part of the ecosystem uh, when you take a large predator out uh, the ecosystem collapses and uh, We've seen this happen in uh, many uh, areas outside uh, Sri Lanka and also within Sri Lanka, but there are published uh, evidence of this outside. This is something to think about. Uh, and also, there are also key mesopredator suppressors where they feed on uh, mongoose and uh, uh, keep control of mongoose and also uh, jackal in Sri Lanka. And, but apart from all this, I think something that will really appeal authorities and uh, politicians is that uh, to remember that the Sri Lankan leopard is, is a key revenue generator for a, a major contributor for our GDP uh, with the increase of wildlife tourism. As I saying, there are people that visit uh, Sri Lanka spending $800, $900 per person per night and spend a couple of days just to see leopards. And, and uh, we, uh, this is something, uh, the economic, economical value is something uh, uh, we can also really think of and use to conserve uh, uh, remaining forests and protect our subspecies, uh, mm -hmm. of the unique subspecies of leopard. <clears throat> so do we really have any hope uh, for the future? Um, I really hope so. And, but just looking at uh, some of the... Uh, incursions that had happened uh, towards uh, our forests over um, that happened this year and some of the policy changes. Uh, I think we are in a very a bad position and it's, it's high time that uh, politicians and authorities really pay attention and uh, uh, get there and reset uh, properly uh, to start all, start all over and get things right. And uh, uh, on a positive note, there was his latest landmark judgment that came out uh, last uh, Monday on the Vilpatu case, as I spoke earlier, where these uh, IDPs were uh, resettled. And uh, one of the key points in this judgment uh, is that the judge highlighted the fact that how important it is to uh, follow the law under the Forest Conservation Ordinance over time. Uh, what sections of the ordinance has been ignored uh, in, in many areas and there are ongoing court cases. I think this really sets a uh, strong precedence uh, for com coming court cases. And some another point I would like to highlight, uh, which uh, the judges uh, the Court of Appeal highlighted, is that is they resurrected, they gave prominence to Article 27 and Article 28. And in this case, uh, it says that the state has a responsibility uh, to preserve and protect the environment for the benefit of the, com of the community in, in Sri Lanka. And in this case, the judges highlighted that the judiciary is part of the state <clears throat> and the ju judiciary has this responsibility as well. This sends out a strong message to the executive and the legislature uh, to follow uh, the constitution when it comes to uh, environmental matters and that they are also bound by the constitution uh, as a key governance of uh, the state. And uh, on that note, I, uh, I will end my uh, talk and I would like to uh, request the public uh, to make sure to learn more about environment and, uh, and uh, study more about it. and. Uh, because ultimately, ultimately, it's the public who, uh, who are able to voice themselves out and uh, control all other entities. I am extremely grateful for uh, the DWC for providing us uh, the permit to carry out this uh, project. 
and Mr. Chamath Lakshman, uh, the park warden who has worked uh, extremely well to uh, uh, protect its national park, or protects his national park, and also uh, the wildlife trackers that helped us uh, during the survey. This is a collective effort uh, with the Leopard Trust and environmental organization uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, Environment Foundation of uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, and also Dr. Alex uh, and Justine Alexander and Dr. Arjun Gopalaswamy uh, that helped us, uh, uh, that are part of this team. And, uh, and I'm also extremely grateful for uh, Javana Fernando of Kulu Safaris who uh, uh, helped us uh, with logistics and providing all the vehicles that required uh, to carry out the project. And he also gave us his team uh, to, uh, to do this, uh, uh, carry out this effort tirelessly uh, throughout this uh, period. And uh, Suraj Gunawardana and Linda for helping us uh, during uh, giving us, giving their property. And of course, LLC, uh, Simodorovsky Foundation, uh, Rufford's Foundation, and International Animal Rescue and, and beyond for sponsoring us. <clears throat> uh, we were short of funds, uh, uh, and but they came to, res to rescue and helped us out. And uh, Mr. Sharon Anaykar from LLC, uh, Mr. Feroz Zuma, who helped us uh, in his private uh, uh, capacity, and uh, former DIG, uh, uh, Mr. Imar Latif, uh, who ensured uh, the security uh, was uh, all good for Vipath National Park prior to our project. And again, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity, and also thank Dr. Shriani, Rukshan, Spencer, Zainab, and Dev that helped me out uh, for uh, this lecture. And uh, also WNPS for uh, for this opportunity again, and I'm privileged uh, to come here for the second time and talk about another large carnivore. Uh, in, in Thank you again, and uh, you can now throw your questions at me. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Rina. Fantastic stuff. Um, so I have a ton of questions people have been posting and sending, and um, I think we'll not be able to cover all of them. <clears throat> Let me start with some simpler ones. You know, so we spoke of about uh, 100 plus, 133 lepers that you identified and things like that. But I guess those are over a different period of time. So one question is really, you know, how, how, many, how many lepers are really living in Sri Lanka? In the park, in in Vilpatu Park. In Vilpatu. Yeah. What do you think is the current density there yeah. now? Based on our best model uh, through our analysis, uh, we looked at the uh, available population. We extrapolated uh, uh, the pop total population uh, in the Vilpatu National Park and its surrounding areas, where we extend a thirty kilometer buffer around it. And uh, which incorporates most of the protected area. And uh, looking at the distribution of uh, uh, activity centers uh, through this, uh, the model gave us a number of 355 individuals uh, uh, in this area. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, so that's, that's a fantastic number. So, so there was, a, you know, some intrigue. I also noticed that, you know, the, the density in Vilpatu. Uh, in your model was very close to the density in Horton Plains. Yes. Right? So that's a very interesting uh, number. And there's also been always a discussion around, you know, where is the highest uh, wow. animal uh, leopard density? Because this question, you know, crops up from time to time. Uh, you want to take a shot at that? Uh, is it Yala or is it one of these other oh, locations? Wow. Or is it <laughs> somewhere else in the world? Well, I don't think that really matters what the... Uh, what, what the limit is and what the highest number is. And I would say wherever there is sufficient protection and uh, and also, it, of course, there are internal uh, pressures as well, such as uh, social strife and infanticide. You know, there's one the other population dynamics and seasonality that affect um, uh, the leopard densities over time, which is why I mentioned that one-time surveys really don't tell a, tell a, tell a good story. 
it is essential that we carry out these surveys over time. And this is when we will get to know um, uh, about uh, uh, how well our populations are doing in, 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 in national parks such as Wilpato. So I'm doing a similar thing with, with crocodiles. In this case, I'm, going, I'm doing biannual surveys. And uh, so I'm getting a population trend. And we've seen this with uh, examples like Pantius bandula, uh, bandula uh, a fish species that is found in uh, one particular area. And uh, Professor Devaka has carried out long-term surveys and uh, seen uh, long-term trends of populations, so dips and uh, highs of, uh, of these trends. And uh, so all these landscapes which were studied, for example, like Horton Plains, uh, Yala, Vipattu, and we should also look at other places. And uh, we should really look at uh, studying this in the long term. And uh, yeah, now for the so, tourism purposes, yes, it, it might really help out uh, in, in, in right. uh, for tourists. But yeah, uh, like I said, we should remember that we are an island, and uh, all these things can change within a couple of years if you make the bad decisions. The decisions. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, has there been any thought around uh, two questions I'm going to pose at the same time? Has there been any thought around, you know, translocating any leopards from, say, Vilpatu to the Yala area and vice versa to kind of diversify the gene pool or anything like that? Uh, G pardon, what, what did you say in the last bit? Uh, diversify, diversify the gene pool gene. Or to have, yeah. Right. So, based on. Uh, Dr. Mithapala's work and some recent work uh, done uh, way, way back in 2001. Uh, there's a bit of bad news uh, in terms of the Sri Lankan leopard. Uh, it is actually uh, a genetically less diverse uh, subspecies. And uh, this is something to keep in mind as well. And uh, so that's why we should have connections between, uh, between uh, protected area to support all this. Translocating leopards is not a is not a we don't really need that right now and we because both both Yala Vilpatu are doing very well as it seems mm -hmm. and both both uh, landscapes are very well connected with uh, other protected area and right. uh, if you look at the protected area network you see Yala connected with Kumana then further north of La it connects with Lavagala further north fragmented but still connects to Galloway and then Madroya and also Vascuma. So leopards use terrain, uh, undisturbed terrain that you would not even think of, right? So right. The, the point here is to uh, look for areas where they do use. You can set up camera traps and uh, study this and then make sure these are protected once you identify them and make okay. sure are involved. Translocating animals and uh, to to make, mix a gene pool, uh, I don't think that will work. And I think we need to update uh, and do a thorough study uh, of population genetics in the island, uh, especially uh, looking at the montane uh, and the wet zone species with the wet zone, wet zone populations, and uh, uh, which are highly fragmented, and uh, uh, and also the rest of its range. And uh, mind you, uh, having a big population like uh, Yala Vipatu, uh, like you said, uh, is not a good indication that uh, they're doing, they're genetically doing well. We have come across some uh, individuals uh, where we think uh, could be uh, uh, what we're observing is possible because of uh, uh, genetic uh, uh, depression. Yeah. Depression, and uh, this is something we are really looking at, uh, and we will make it public uh, with, with the coming. Uh, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you're talking a lot about uh, camera traps, uh, and then you were speaking about the, the you know, your access by boat. Uh, talk to us a little bit about two things. One is, you know, what goes into the selection of a tra camera trap location, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and also maybe, you know, just cover the fishing angle of uh, the leopards, you know, how keen are they on fish as prey? Right, so uh, so we uh, usually we, uh, you set up camera traps where leopards are present and you basically uh, select the select landscape and place uh, points arbitrarily uh, in a landscape and then uh, select the areas where you think, and we're also with the availability of uh, your camera traps and select the key places 
uh, to set up your camera traps and also keep in mind uh, the distance between camera traps. And uh, you shouldn't have anything uh, less very small where it can lead to autocorrelation where you have frequent captures of a particular individual which will distort results and also it should be placed uh, way too much far away. But the current Bayesian and maximum likelihood methods uh, of analysis uh, inference really uh, helps out for uh, all these uh, discrepancies uh, of, uh, of uh, the field uh, restrictions. And uh, in terms of fishing, I personally have not heard of uh, uh, Sri Lankan leopards uh, uh, fishing. I've not even seen fish bones in, uh, in scat of the little I have uh, gone through. I believe Rukshan could probably give a broad answer, but they do uh, the, in Africa. In, in some parts of India where they've observed uh, uh, the fishing on uh, catfish and in uh, dry uh, mud areas. Yeah. But I also must mention, uh, since you uh, talk, talked about this, that I found bear's cat in this particular camera trap station uh, with uh, remains of crab uh, shell. And this was something that really um, got me excited about. <clears throat> yeah. Oh. Uh, I mean, we, we are seeing the buffer zones being literally buffered down to nothing. Uh, we've seen it in Yala where, you know, now you have the tourism industry and the military and lots of other things pretty much housed at the doorstep of and right along what used to be the buffer zone in the good old days. And now you're seeing the same move where, you know, the buffer is coming literally to the edge of the park. Uh, and you also spoke of these increasing attacks, right? So how frequent, firstly, do we see attacks uh, in and around Wilpato? Is it a very rare occasion? And, you know, how do you see this trend around the buffer zone uh, uh, being taken out of the equation? What's going to happen in that result? I think it would put a lot on, on large carnivores such as leopards, as I've described earlier. And uh, in Vilpatru, with, with, with the data I have, it seems that it's very infrequent. And leopards, just like in India, uh, they have adapted themselves very well to live uh, in coexistence with humans. And it's uh, especially, uh, uh, we've seen this uh, in, in Yala, Vilpatru, and some parts of Sri Lanka as well. And uh, in India, where they uh, Especially uh, temporarily partition themselves uh, uh, and avoid humans uh, in the landscape, and uh, yeah, but destroying buffer zones and encroaching into buffer zones is the first step. The next step is, of course, these people going into the national park and other protected area, and uh, this is going to cause uh, more and more problems in the future. And if you look at incidents. Uh, the past few decades and compared how it was uh, back then. Uh, we're beginning to hear more and more uh, interactions, negative interactions between leopards and uh, humans. This could be because the high number of reporting and the diversified, uh, diverse different uh, social media and media uh, types that are available where news comes in very fast, but uh, yeah. So, okay. yeah. so uh, I mean, you, you mentioned and uh, we've seen the huge number of uh, leopard deaths this year, so much so that, you know, when the black uh, leopard died, uh, the WNPS called on, you know, commemorating that day more as a leopard day every year, just to kind of focus uh, media and attention every year on this plight. Uh, any... Any indications of any black leopard uh, rumors in Wilpatu is one of the questions. Um, and, um, you know, do these wardens really come under political threat uh, when they're trying to, you know, play these roles? Because we've seen the politicians abusing these extended areas. On black leopards, uh, for me, I, uh, if it's black or not, it doesn't matter. It's just, uh, it's a phenotypic. Uh, variation of the leopard and yes it's it's something that highlights and grabs the attention of the public so it is it is important uh, that we can use the black leopard as a mascot and as a whole uh how can you say a representation for uh, leopards and get the public engaged and i 
and I was really happy to see that they declared uh, and proposed to declare that uh, this particular date where this sad thing happened uh, 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 as a leopard day for Sri Lanka, because it was just what, three, four months after uh, we discovered that there was a black leopard uh, on, on, on camera and uh, yeah. was solid evidence. So yes, and uh, it's, it's important. In Vilpathu, there have been rumors and I, also, I have a close colleague co colleague that uh, swears that he saw the black leopard, and I, I believe him. Uh, but uh, I placed my camera traps in these areas, and I also listened, uh, got some news about uh, uh, from the army uh, saying that they have observed uh, black leopards in this particular part of uh, Vilpatu. And uh, I, had, I had camera traps stationed in these areas. Uh, 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 before I uh, got this news, and uh, but I must say I ran these camera traps for a good period, 93 day period, and I did not come across any uh, any, okay. any black leopards. Yeah. Uh, they could be there, but what uh, what what they're saying is uh, what, what what we are finding out is that uh, <clears throat> uh, black leopards are more common and found in areas where there is more high humid. Uh, humid in no humid areas, and uh, one of the most prominent areas in the world is uh, uh, the lower parts of the uh, uh, Isthmus of Kra, where pretty much 70 to 90 percent of the population uh, uh, of, are of la black leopards. And we see this trend in in uh, in, uh, in in Sri Lanka as well, and Africa and other parts of its range. And uh, they say it's because of uh, Glogger's rule uh, that talks about um, uh, uh, selective uh, pressure in terms of uh, humid and uh, in areas such as that where black animals benefit uh, over colored indi individuals uh, based on uh, disease or even uh, absorbing uh, sunlight uh, and uh, and also of course the camouflage really helps them and also um, this this notion of uh, animals that are inbred are a result of uh, black leopards are a result of inbreeding. That notion is put off. Uh, so it's these things that we can really look at closely uh, in the future. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> and also you should discuss that idea that black leopards are a different subspecies uh, of, uh, of leopards in Sri Lanka. Uh, it would be good to look at the genetic integrity of the whole population in the island, yes. Uh, but uh, yeah. And the other one about park wardens, um, yes, if you look at the over time, park wardens are under pressure, and we've had some really sad news uh, where we saw park wardens get into trouble when they tried to follow the law uh, a couple of years back, and uh, it resulted in one of our strong uh, director generals uh, resigning as well. And I must say, uh, there are pretty much all, all the park wardens I know, uh, you know, I know personally, are extremely. Uh, strong and they don't really care about uh, external political pressure. For example, like the park warden of Vipatu is, is quite strong. He doesn't, he's, he's quite uh, independent in his decision, decision making. And I hope this stays strong and I really hope there are politicians watching uh, to avoid you know, unnecessary interventions uh, 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 with encroachment and uh, other unnecessary pressures uh, into the Department of Wildlife and the Department in general. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, if if we were conducting our lecture today at the BMI stage, we would have had a hall full and beyond just so you know, dinner, because we've had a huge number of people and also the participants uh, from overseas, I see, uh, ranging from uh, US and uh, there's Africa, there's uh, different parts of Europe, all the way down to uh, different parts of Asia and uh, Australia, so I think we've got a fantastic international audience also. I see a couple of people from India. Uh, interesting questions coming up, uh, including things like, you know, let's talk a little bit on the research side before I get into the legal side and some of that part of it. Um, you know, how much of uh, color tracking is really done in Sri Lanka because you get, uh, you know, lots of tigers, tractor claws, large tracks in India and collars help and all of that. Uh, what kind of collar tracking research is done in Sri Lanka? And secondly, taking off from something you mentioned earlier, 
is there much of state-run research on this area or is it more the private individuals uh, and academia who do it through their own interest? I think research in Sri Lanka is mostly done by private individuals that have uh, uh, that have a genuine passion for wildlife and uh, spend their own money uh, conducting research and uh, spend their own private time to generate uh, the understanding that we all already have now. And uh, most of these people, they have uh, other jobs and uh, still would spend a lot of their time and effort on this. And uh, uh, yeah, and, and with, the, with the first question with the color research, uh, I have seen paper articles where a group of uh, uh, scientists uh, in Sri Lanka are planning to do color, uh, track leopards in, in, uh, in human dominated landscapes. I think this is a really good, um, uh, it will be a really good initiative to understand leopard movement in, uh, in the mountain areas and disturbed areas of uh, of, uh, of these mountain landscapes. And uh, <clears throat> it will be also good in a pure research research sense to understand what the home range, home range size and uh, dispersal activity within uh, a national parks like Yala or even uh, Vilpatu. But it's, putting up collars is extremely costly and uh, it also it, it's a, it puts a lot of uh, threat towards the animal as well. Uh, you know, in terms of its, uh, because it will uh, catch the animal and uh, subdue it and then put on the collar, which so many things can go wrong. But I think a cheaper way to understand movement is would be to uh, carry out long-term camera traps projects uh, in and around the landscape of, uh, for example, like Vipatu, and then use the existing database to match up uh, species, uh, the, the individuals, to see how they're dispersing and uh, get an understanding about that. Yeah. Do, do, do you guys uh, ever bring these different research databases together? Uh, pardon me for saying this, but I know that in the research community, people are very protective about their research and, you know, not everyone is as open to share data and you have all these pockets of information. So where does this come together? especially when it's done privately and individually, like you described. Yes, so some, one of the suggestions I had uh, is uh, even during a meeting we had in WNPS is to have a collate all the data and make a, make sure, make a national database on, on our leopards. And this yeah. way we can uh, work on the idea that I just spoke about, uh, like they do with tigers uh, in, 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 in India. And... Uh, I think this is something that we should really look at, and uh, because there's only a handful of researchers that work work on leopards, and yeah. if we can all just get together and uh, and uh, get this thing up and uh, running, it will be it will be it will be beneficial in the long run. Yeah. Sure. I mean, uh, WNPS, if ever needed, we'd be happy to play a neutral mediator and play a role in uh, collating these. If you know researchers would like us to play that role, because we would have only a conservation interest. So let's see, I think, you know, collaboration has to be a way forward if we want to kind of collectively do more. Um, so, I, I, I mean, uh, there, there's this recent thing around drones. Uh, the, the military is setting up a unit for drones and they're using that to monitor, you know, the COVID violators. I wish we could set up a drone unit to monitor the political violators that might <laughs> help us in these areas, but uh, how practical do you think it is to use drones for monitoring poaching and things like that? I think it will be uh, very useful. And uh, I think this is something that it, our department can uh, uh, incorporate into the anti-poaching anti uh, 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 units, uh, either by the military or when they ever develop uh, uh, their own uh, unit in the future. Mm -hmm. And even they can use uh, it right now uh, because you can remotely uh, monitor, uh, look for uh, poaching activities, especially, like I said, when poachers, they come in and they go about their business and they stay in the park and dry the meat up. And uh, you can always look for signs of these through drones. And uh, one thing I would like to uh, uh, tell, tell the, and also tell the department in, in one way is that we can use drones to monitor prey 
uh, abundance and distribution of prey uh, and do aerial counts without spending money on helicopters. Uh, now that you have drones, you can uh, grid an area, select uh, uh, a portion, and then uh, carry out uh, abundance uh, counts on uh, on deer and other prey species of uh, national parks. Yeah. Okay. I'll take one or two more questions because we are kind of close to time and I mean, there's a lot more I have, but let's shift to the legal side. Uh, Everybody is keen to know, you know, firstly, uh, I, I think one question I can kind of answer, I saw that on the news that, you know, this judgment on the reforesting uh, that the minister was handed down, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's going to be under supervision by the authorities and the forest, reg- you know, the regulatory side. So it's not just going to be a, haphazard reforestation on its own. So we just hope that works out uh, properly. But uh, just give us uh, what you know about the latest on these different cases and, you know, will they really block off that road? Um, You know, are there any other new challenges emerging? Uh, There have been a couple of questions around that whole area. Right. And, uh, yeah, so... The the judgment was very strong, and uh, they they did suggest uh, reforesting a similar area somewhere somewhere else, and uh, 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 that was uh, lost in, in that area of Wilpatu. And I think I hope, really hope the department of uh, forest department would follow up and uh, uh, pressure whoever is responsible to uh, carry out this. And uh, something what uh, uh, as a follow up, uh, something what other environmental groups and uh, 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 can do is that uh, uh, go to courts again and uh, work on the uh, eviction eviction of IDPs uh, that would be a different case on uh, the different facts uh, different facts and also uh, also push uh, f- find a way legally to reforest these damaged areas after eviction happens. So Virpatu is one just very famous case that we have heard due to media uh, sensationalization. I, I shouldn't be really saying Virpatu, I keep saying that, but uh, there are other cases even worse than what we saw uh, with the Northern Virpatu boundary uh, incursion. Uh, for example, is, is Hagdala Nature Reserve. And uh, I would like to uh, ask, uh, if anyone knows about this, because this is a case that has not got any attention. Uh, it's an ongoing court case. And uh, what I heard is that there were eviction orders for the settlers as well. So Haggala is a strict nature reserve. Yeah, strict nature reserve, uh, the highest protected land in Sri Lanka, higher than uh, the protection a national park receives under the wildlife department. But since its declaration, uh, within 15 years onwards, uh, land was encroached and this famous uh, massive milk farm encroached and their properties within uh, the strict nature reserve. And uh, since then, several uh, uh, precedents uh, also allowed uh, uh, encroachment. And now there are schools and uh, and uh, permanent settlers uh, in, in, in and around uh, Haggala Nature Reserve, Strict Nature Reserve. So there are many cases like this uh, which are not heard of, and uh, I think it's 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 it would be good if uh, the media can uh, really look closely into these cases. And EFA handles several cases. The WNPS WNPS handles uh, several cases, and uh, yeah. So that's a, those are things that uh, and Haggala is is a very important. Uh, Mountain forest this is a key watershed area, and uh, if these encroachments keep happening, and we have come across uh, during field visits, we have come across uh, poaching activities uh, in these areas where people set up snares just just near the just near their houses to uh, catch the wild boar. And uh, this, and this, once they set up a snare, they they don't they don't just set one snare; they set about thirty snares in that area. Wow. Oh. And it's 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 likely that leopards uh, do get killed, and most of these just go un, 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 unheard of. And uh, so, yeah. So I think the media has a role in this case to dig up uh, and look for uh, right. cases. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, just uh, on that note, if there are any people, I mean, I know there are people on the call 
who have connections and who are some of them I know from the list of names uh, are directly linked with media or part of media. So our ask would be to kind of help us take this message out. Uh, if you need our help to kind of organize a trip to some of these areas so that you can see firsthand, uh, we have networks, we can tap into researchers such as Dinal and so many others to uh, go to these hotspots so that you can kind of see for yourself and do the write-up. That's how the partnership should happen between media and conservationists. Uh, Wilpat was, uh, you know, fought very hard by many, many parties when it came to the Baruddin's uh, encroachment. And uh, I think, you know, hopefully we are seeing some turning, but uh, is it too late? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's never too late. So we, we need to continue that battle. And uh, I'm going to leave you with one last question, which is to link with uh, tourism and, you know, certainly the over-visitation of parks, because we've seen that in Yala, um, there have been many proposals to kind of uh, control the visitation, all of that, but politicians and economics and Western parties have always fought those so on one side, tourism industry wants to protect, on the other side, the industry wants to explore this. Uh, what is the behavioral impact on these deep populations uh, on leopards, because on one side, yes, we know they see the jeeps as a neutral party, but how do how does it affect hunting, mating, and other behavioral sides of a leopard? Yeah, so it all comes to the down to the behavior of jeep drivers. Like I said earlier, uh, if they if they if they come if they disturb an animal intentionally and uh, then it will disrupt their behavior. And we might not see the leopard again. And uh, we have seen this in Yala uh, several times where the leopard, because of the behavior of jeeps, uh, where leopards are the leopards becoming shy and avoid uh, vehicles. And uh, I must add something uh, to this too, uh, based on a couple of observations I've had, where <laughs> leopards use vehicles uh, as a way to benefit their hunting. And I've seen this a couple of times where they use the sound of jeeps whenever an engine was switched on. They would use a sound to stalk, get close to a prey and uh, 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 try and uh, 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 what, go ahead with the hunt. And uh, this is a very interesting observation I saw a couple of times in Yala. And uh, of course we've seen lions in uh, Masai Mara uh, using vehicles as a cover to uh, to attack deer, and uh, I think when it comes to uh, looking at uh, controlling numbers in a in a national park, I I don't have an answer for that because uh, uh, how I see it is that um, if if all jeeps behave properly and understand the concept of habituation and work well, uh, and, and since the animals are habituated uh, as well, it, it it should not be a problem, but at some point, uh, yes, there must be a cap, but my question is, uh, what's the cap? Uh, and this is a uh, something that we should call it all experts and uh, look at uh, look at this uh, situation. Uh, one option would be to uh, cut off all uh, uh, budget uh, safari goals and make our national parks just open for high-end tourism. And then you can use, you may cap the number to 50 jeeps or 40 jeeps or so, and then uh, make use of it. But I don't know how, how that's that's going to be uh, sustainable um, in a country like this, especially uh, when so many communities are dependent on uh, the tourism aspect uh, surrounding national parks. Yeah. Good. All right, Dina. I, I would, we could love to go on, but I know we have a time crunch. Uh, so just once again, on behalf of WNPS, thank you very much for joining us today. And please continue the great work you're doing. Uh, please put out more of this information, uh, which will help us to help you to help the authorities to conserve uh, these species. And we all know that the leopards are a keystone species. And as a result of conserving them, so many other uh, elements in the ecosystem and other animals get uh, conserved and uh, so therefore we hope that this work continues good luck with everything 
And uh, let me also thank the WNPS team who's been at different locations managing the logistics for the uh, webcast today. And again, thank the full house of uh, number, large numbers of people who joined from all over Sri Lanka and all over the world today to uh, participate. Uh, we hope we'll catch you at a future lecture. And please don't forget, we need your help. We need your time, some funds to keep us uh, continuing to engage in the battles of reforestation and conservation. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Thank, Good night. You. Thank you.